Um, so thanks everyone for sticking around for another talk after a day of talks. Um, so I'm Natalie and I'm going to be basically talking about my PhD, uh, which I did at UBC, and title of the talk, Maternal Stress in Salmon. Um, as Jody mentioned, I like doing communication in creative ways, so hopefully you don't find my poetic take on my PhD too cheesy. Uh, so let's start. There was a Canadian river, wild and free. It teemed with Pacific salmon, red as can be. The salmon mated and died. Their babies swam to sea, eventually returning home. The cycle beneath. And so this river that I speak of is a Canadian river, and it's in Canada, which we have here just floating in space. We've got the Atlantic Ocean on the east coast, Pacific Ocean on the west, and so for some reference, here is Toronto in the southern part of Ontario, and Hamilton would be kind of like here. Um, and then if we head over all the way to the west coast, we've got Vancouver in British Columbia. And Vancouver is at the southern tip of BC. And here we have the Fraser River watershed, which feeds into the Pacific Ocean. And so if we zoom in on British Columbia, we can get a closer look here at the Fraser River, the main stem, as well as all of its major tributaries. And the Fraser River is a Canadian heritage river, so it's old. Uh, it's believed to have flowed this course for about 4 million years. It's the longest river in BC at about 1,300 kilometers. And it's named after Simon Fraser, the uh, Scottish fur trader. For the purposes of this talk, of course, it's the largest producer of wild salmon in Canada, including the brilliant red species sockeye salmon. And Pacific salmon in general have this kind of tragically romantic life cycle, which I'm going to review for all of us. So here we have our spawning uh, couple, and they have arrived into their freshwater river. It's about fall, September to November. The males usually arrive first, choose a territory, females arrive, pick a mate, and then the female will use her caudal fin to dig out some gravel in the ground to make a depression, and this is called a red. It's where her eggs are going to be released. And this is simultaneous to sperm being released. Fertilized eggs are now in that gravel bed. Female covers up the eggs with some gravel, and she'll guard them for as long as she can, which really will only be a couple of hours to a couple of days, because after the males and females spawn, they both die. And so now we're overwintering December to March, and we have our baby salmon incubating underneath that gravel in the riverbed. And so um, you can't really see in this picture, but they get these giant cute eyes and then they explode out of the shell and they have their giant yolk sacs that they feed off of. And once that yolk sac is fully absorbed, this is timed with spring when there's um, large algal blooms. And all of the uh, baby salmon that have absorbed their yolk sac will uh, emerge or rise up from the gravel and they'll all migrate down to a freshwater rearing area. And the goal here is basically to grow, um, eat, and not be eaten. And so they'll stay in that freshwater rearing area for one to two years, at which time environmental cues will trigger uh, a whole bunch of changes in their body that basically start to prepare them for a life in salt water. These freshwater fish that have spent one to two years in freshwater now have to prepare for the ocean. And so they'll migrate down the Fraser River out into the ocean and they're called smolt. Once they're in the ocean, this is a bit of a black box. Um, we do know that they spend between two to three years in the ocean. Again, the goal is eating, growing, and avoiding being eaten. And um, environmental cues, hormonal cues eventually trigger the fish to now start changing from a saltwater fish back to a freshwater fish because it's time to reproduce. And so they'll enter the uh, Fraser River again in the fall. We're basically about four years from fertilization now. The fish stop feeding and then they'll migrate back home where they find their mate and the cycle starts all over again. So fairly complicated but also interesting. Um, so, I'll go back one. Although salmon are, um, I call them like the celebrities of the Fraser River, there are other animals that also call this river home, which as you will see, there are also eagles and grizzly bears, 
predator and prey, an evolutionary pair. But the waters have changed from what has been as time moves forward in the Anthropocene. So here we have um, an old map of the Fraser River. This is kind of the lower part of it, uh, Pacific Ocean on the left. And in Pacific salmon evolutionary history, they would encounter some First Nations traditional fisheries. There's going to be predators, wildfires, and also salmon have to navigate hydrodynamically um, challenging areas of the river as adults when they're migrating upstream. Now, if we fast forward to today, this is what an adult salmon is encountering during their migration home. So at the mouth of the river, there has been significant industrial um, development as well as urbanization, which has resulted in some boat traffic. Um, there's agricultural influences a little bit upstream. Now we have, um, in addition to First Nations fisheries, commercial and recreational fisheries, groundwater use, river temperatures are warming during that migration time. Some uh, populations of salmon have to surpass a hydro dam to actually get to their spawning grounds. And now we have forestry practices that are also going to be changing water quality. And so just to give some more visuals of how dramatic uh, the river has changed for these fishes, this is the village of New Westminster in the 1850s. And here is the Fraser River. And here is the city of New Westminster, which is a suburb of Vancouver, growing population of 65,000. And if you squint back here, you can see the Fraser, Fraser River, and there's some bridges. And just for an aerial shot, that's the Fraser River. So each year, millions of salmon are passing through this area where you have a whole range of industry, city on the top, they're basically commuting through the city to get to their spawning grounds. <coughs> so these nets, dams, pollution, and heat are stressed out salmon facing defeat. Millions still return, but fewer each year. Scientists are wondering, the answers aren't clear. So in the case of sockeye salmon, we have been seeing a precipitous decline in certain populations since the early 90s. And so this is a graph of productivity, which is the metric used to quantify these declines. And basically it's uh, on the y-axis, the number of offspring returning home per spawning female. And so we can see that in the 70s and 80s, for each spawning female, about four years later, six of her babies came back, which is still <laughs> incredibly low considering that a female is probably releasing a couple thousand eggs. So um, high mortality. Once we hit the 90s, we see the number starts to climb, declining. Here in 2008, we have barely one offspring coming home for each female. And so in a way, the populations are not replacing themselves. And in 2009, there was a massive collapse of the sockeye salmon stocks. Um, 10 to 12 million were expected to return back. Less than 2 million came back. And now we have a situation where the females are not replacing themselves. And so this collapse was, of course, a crisis for Canada. And uh, Canada's Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, issued the Cohen inquiry of the decline. I'm not even going to say it right. It's so long. They wanted to figure out why the sockeye were declining. <laughs> there it is. The Cohen, the Commission of Inquiry into the Decline of Sockeye Salmon in the Fraser River. And so. Um, this was a huge deal. This took place over three years. Uh, government and academic scientists, industry representatives, representatives from all of the fishery sectors, NGOs, all testified in court in front of the Honorable uh, Bruce Cohen and basically said their piece of how all of these different stressors may be influencing or not influencing the decline of sockeye salmon. And Basically, this report, um, yeah, they wanted to answer the question, well, what is causing all these declines? Is it all, what out of all these stressors is going to be the reason? And over $20 million later, the probably self-evident answer to that question is there's no smoking gun, it's complicated. Um, so, of course, all these headlines emerge after the report is issued, and uh, Bruce Cohen concluded that it's a factor of that includes cumulative stressors. So if I go back here, it's all of these things. 
what the relative contribution is, we don't know. And it's factors that are both in the saltwater and the freshwater environment, and there's factors that are affecting all life stages. Now, at the end of this report, um, Bruce Cohen provides 75 research recommendations. And one of them is about uh, intergenerational effects. Because if these declines are continuing across generations, then there may be some factor there that we're missing that is um, basically what the parents are experiencing is leaving a legacy on the offspring and those offspring are not coming back. So I've just highlighted kind of the key words, little research on multiple stressors, this is an information gap critical to fill, intergenerational effects. And um, so this seemed like a good match. <laughs> <laughs> so Scott and, um, and I got together and um, figured that, okay, well, let's try to just scratch the surface on intergenerational effects. We're not going to probably get a smoking gun answer, but um, trying to understand that if this is even a potential contributor because it wasn't a big player in that Cohen report. So what's, I keep, <laughs> I'm advancing my prompts here. Um, what is, so looking at maternal stress and seeing if it's going to influence offspring, um, of course you can't talk about stress without cortisol. So if a mother's stress hormones get too high, would that mean her babies were more likely to die? And if cortisol is traveling from mother to row, maybe this would alter how her offspring grow. And do all these stressors affect what is next? Maybe baby salmon are born already vexed. And so this is kind of the working hypothesis. If fewer offspring return home and mothers are encountering numerous stressors, then maternal stress may be compromising offspring quality. And this isn't anything new. And this hypothesis has been tested and there's a lot of evidence for uh, consequences of maternal stress in the biomedical world. Um, some really neat work looking at rodents and transgenerational effects. And uh, there's also work in mammals, bird literature. We have a pretty good understanding that yes, maternal stress is bad. Um, but of course, as we also heard today at some talks, there's research um, that's been done on fishes to try to understand effects of maternal stress and the mechanisms that might be causing offspring change. So, to walk through this kind of schematic here of um, what we thought was going on, was here's our mom, she's exposed to a chronic stressor, and good amount of work says that, well, when a mom is chronically exposed to a stressor, that we're going to see a chronic elevation in plasma cortisol, her stress hormone. Now, when she's chronically exposed and we have the chronically elevated plasma cortisol, that could result in chronically elevated concentrations of this hormone in her eggs. And finally, the chronic exposure to the mom with the chronically elevated plasma cortisol and egg, elevated egg cortisol will reduce offspring quality. Um, so we first focused on um, this part. Wanted to know, well, is egg cortisol even a candidate, a good, like, even though this looks great, um, how does it actually alter offspring phenotype? And so we took eggs from mature uh, sockeye, or in this case it was coho salmon, mature salmon, and we fertilize them. So we do all our fertilizations in mason jars. You'll never look at a mason jar the same way. Again, you put the eggs in the sperm, you add water. <laughs> then we talked up the fertilization water with more water that was dosed with cortisol. And the cortisol dosing was either 1,000 nanograms per mil or zero. And 1,000 nanograms per mil is a measurement of cortisol that you can detect in the plasma of females on spawning grounds. And then we let the eggs sit in that cortisol mixture for two hours, and then we measured a cortisol concentration with EIA. And so um, this is some work that was done for Coho, just showing you that this method is effective for elevating egg cortisol levels, which we can use as a proxy for what we expect to happen under maternal stress. So here we just have the range that we detected in pre-fertilized eggs of salmon. When we look at what happens two hours post-fertilization, so after they've done that um, bathing in the 
hormone-treated water. Uh, don't see much change between pre- and post-fertilization for the untreated eggs or zero um, concentration of zero cortisol. And when we look at the cortisol-treated eggs, we can see it's significantly higher um, and sort of outside of the range of what we detected naturally in our pre-fertilized eggs. For some reference, some work done in the 90s, they chased coho salmon for two weeks during the final stages of sexual maturation, and they detected egg cortisol levels of about 25 nanograms per gram, so we're higher, but not pharmacologically higher. And salmon that were not chased had about nine nanograms, so that's in line with our control. And just for kicks, 24 hours later, everything is lowered um, and we don't see differences now between our hormone-treated eggs and the controls. So again, it works. Um, we then, of course, we wanted to know, well, that's great, like the method works, but is that very brief cortisol exposure um, affecting offspring phenotype? Could it be um, the link between maternal stress and offspring quality? So one of the traits that we looked at was uh, their behavior to a conspecific. So here you're just seeing two coho bite. Okay. Um, and what we saw was that there was a tendency for the offspring reared from cortisol treated eggs in the uh, dark bar here to increase activity, feeding, and shelter use when they were exposed to their conspecific intruder. We then took these offspring, this one's a bit laggy, but not like that. Um, if you were a fish, this was the simulated predator attack because we wanted to see your behavior in response to um, this predator attack. And again, we see this general increase in activity, increase in feeding, and increased use of open space um, versus being in the shelter for offspring reared from the cortisol treated eggs. So, yes. When we manipulated egg cortisol levels, we did see changes in offspring phenotype, so we feel confident that egg cortisol is a good candidate for mediating offspring change. But of course, what we really want to know is, well, what happens when you actually stress out the moms? So this time we took sockeye moms and we intercepted them when they're about six weeks away from spawning. So they still entered freshwater, um, but we got them before they had reached their spawning areas. We then brought them into large outdoor tanks. Half of the tanks we left alone. The other half I got to chase with a net twice a day for three minutes, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it's so hard. <laughs> and uh, we did that for six weeks until the fish matured and we could get the eggs from them. So of course, the like, first thing everyone's so excited about, gotta get these eggs and check the egg cortisol because it's gonna be elevated and then I'm gonna rear the babies and there's gonna be all these negative effects. And long story short, no differences in egg cortisol between our chase and control moms, no difference in egg size, no differences in embryo survival, no differences in offspring size. So this was my face. <laughs> I know everyone here just told me to talk and I'm like, this is, it's over. Like, forget it, that hypothesis, not true. All those bird people lied. Um, okay, <laughs> so then like you breathe and you're like, it's okay, it's okay. Um, so maybe what we have going on here is some maternal buffering. Makes sense. These moms only have one opportunity to spawn. Of course, they're going to have some kind of mechanism to make, sh you know, at least protect their babies a little bit. So maybe something is happening here, some kind of physiological buffering mechanism where moms that were exposed to the stressor um, diverted cortisol away from the Um, but, you know, I still raise the babies anyway because you just never know. And so one of the things we looked at was swim performance. So we dropped them into a swim flume, and here um, are the baby is swimming quite fast, about nine body lengths per second. And we found that the offspring reared from chaste mothers swam for a shorter duration. So on average, they are swimming about 40 seconds less than offspring reared from the control mothers. And swimming at this life stage, so the fry stage is when they've just absorbed their yolk sac and they have to eat, grow, and avoid predators while they're in their freshwater rearing area. So what could be the implications of 
uh, reduce swimming duration. Well, this may have effects for predation, especially for if you can't swim for long enough away from other predators that are swimming in the water with you. This is a bull trout and some work done by Nathan Fury in our lab, um, the lab I was in, he basically found that bull trout have an insatiable appetite for salmon. All of these came from the stomach of one bull trout. So, of course, you're all thinking, oh, but you told me there were no differences in egg cortisol. Well, when we saw this result, okay, so maybe there's latent maternal effects. Despite no differences in our perfect candidate hormone, um, we are still seeing differences based on that um, maternal experience. So, now to, <laughs> I like to think of this as, well, we should just balance out this flow chart and chase the babies that we reared from the mothers that we chased. And so that's what we did, but the kind of more um, thoughtful way of why we did this, um, we, what I've shown so far is kind of whole organism responses. I wanted to dabble in the world of physiology, so I um, went and did some work with Katie Gilmore at the University of Ottawa and Jen Jeffrey, who was a PhD student at the time there. And we basically characterized the hypothalamic pituitary interrenal axis of our fish reared from our chaste and control moms. And so the, we did a five minute chase with a net of the babies. And here we have plasma cortisol on the y axis. And we have various time points uh, post this five minute chase. And we can see a nice stress response in both offspring reared from control and chaste mothers. At the one hour time point after the chase, plasma cortisol is elevated. Cool, that's what we expected. And then it starts to decrease. Now, if we focus in on the one hour time point, you will see that the plasma cortisol levels of our babies from the chase moms is significantly lower than babies reared from our control moms. And they also recover back to baseline sooner than our control moms. So this is a bit of a trickier um, question to answer. So why would a, an attenuated cortisol response, what are the implications of that? Well, there may be some good implications. So there's work done with trout with these high and low cortisol responders. And so uh, individuals that respond to an acute stressor with a um, lower cortisol response, so lower plasma cortisol levels, they tend to be more aggressive, which could be advantageous for social interactions, territory disputes. And work that has been recently done in adult sockeye salmon found um, that the individuals that had the lower cortisol response to an acute stressor had increased probability of making it to spawning grounds. So an attenuated cortisol response could be a good thing. Good job, Mom. Um, and so another, this is, I'm getting, I'm putting on my speculative hat, time to speculate. Um, Peter Gluckman, who I just found out is also the science advisor to New Zealand's prime minister. So it was kind of like my nerd moment. I was like, oh, that's so cool. Um, he coined this term predictive adaptive response. Uh, the idea being that if a mom can accurately predict her offspring environment, she can endow those offspring with traits that are going to be matched to that environment and basically increase their chances of survival. So. I'm going to take you on a thought process here where if uh, chaste moms predicted that their babies are going to be entering an environment that's like theirs, so repeated exposure to acute stressors where you're going to have to repeatedly be mounting a stress response, mom might think, well, if you're going to have to keep mounting a stress response, that's going to be energetically costly, so we may as well just produce less cortisol each time. Maybe. Who knows? Um, so to summarize, experimental increases in egg cortisol altered the phenotype of salmon offspring. But maternal stressor exposure did not increase egg cortisol. We did see differences in offspring swimming performance. We also saw differences in the offspring stress response. And I didn't show this uh, data, but the work I did with Katie and Jen we looked at plasma cortisol. We also looked at the mRNA abundance, our proxy for gene expression, for a bunch of genes that are involved in cortisol synthesis. 
and we found that there were some differences in gene expression levels. So this suggests that maybe some of these latent effects that we're seeing um, may be linked to differences in gene expression. But then my PhD ended, so uh. <laughs> um, So experimentally elevating egg cortisol may not be best when trying to mimic what mom does stressed. Mothers may buffer and protect, metabolizing cortisol, keeping levels in check. So are offspring in trouble or better prepared? Will they likely die or will they be spared? Perhaps it depends on environmental match. Is a mother's world the same as a progeny's post-hatch? Epigenetics may also be at play. Eggs are more than hormones at the end of the day. So I, some conclusions from my PhD. Experimentally elevating egg cortisol alters offspring phenotype, but may not always be the best proxy for maternal stress. Um, idea here being that do it reverse of what I did. Stress out the moms, make sure that it's a likely, that you know, the hormone or the candidate that you have chosen is in fact changing because of the maternal stress, and then think about doing these kind of experimental manipulations to really get at mechanism. In the case of the sockeye salmon in our study, um, so I suggested way early on that mothers may have a buffering mechanism. What might be that mechanism? Ideal choice would be type 2, 11 beta hydroxysterol dehydrogenase, or the enzyme that converts cortisol to its inactive form, cortisone. And some work in rainbow trout has found that um, unfertilized eggs all the way up to developing embryos do have the capacity to convert cortisol to cortisone, suggesting that this enzyme may be at play. And we have to talk about this fact that, okay, well, when I looked at swimming performance, that suggested that maybe it was a negative effect of maternal stress. Then we looked at the stress response and can't really say whether that was adaptive or not because it depends on maternal match mismatch. Basically, um, a conclusion being that if we really want to know if maternal stress is bad or good for offspring, testing the offspring in the environment they're expected to encounter is probably the best way to go. And also using um, fitness metrics so that you can say definitively, yes, reduced swimming duration increases predation rate or reduces survival. And the part that I, of course, was most excited about that kind of came out at the end of my PhD was that epigenetics may be part of the picture. So again, I didn't um, show the data, but we were looking at um, mRNA abundance of these different genes, and they were varying between our offspring reared from chaste and controlled mothers. So perhaps this is the mechanism that is driving the effects that I saw in swimming performance and the stress response. And of course, to bring it all back, what was the primary motivation for this PhD well, it was to find out if there are intergenerational effects of stress in salmon. If there are, how do those scale or contribute to these population declines? And um, again, no smoking gun, complicated. Someone articulated it very well today about how you get more questions than answers from your research. Um, and so we did get an idea of, yes, there definitely appears to be effects of maternal experience on offspring, um, but concluding or linking those offspring effects to anything at the population level would definitely need larger scale studies where you're tracking uh, mothers and offspring throughout the life cycle, which of course can be a bit challenging in a migratory species, but it's not as crazy as you may think. So to conclude, that Canadian river, it continues to evolve there remain important problems for us to solve. Can a team with Pacific salmon decades from now? Collaborative research can help us figure out how. <laughs> and so thanks everyone for listening and this PhD um, and all the work I showed was done through an army of people that I owe endless thanks to. Um, and yeah, that's it. <laughs>